An oversimple yes or no referendum was only the start of a hugely convoluted, ultimately futile period deciding what we actually wanted. What did we mean by Brexit? This is part two. One of the major issues to me was what defines sovereignty. Unfortunately, many of the extremists believe it is doing just what we want. There seems no understanding that in global politics, treaties and partnerships such as the EU, NATO, involve states voluntarily agreeing to abide by certain behaviours. For the Leave Ultras, anything that appeared to limit them was automatically selling out Brexit. The Leave campaigns had been deliberately vague about what Brexit meant. It was all sunlit uplands and jingoism, no real detail. That detail never existed. It couldn't. The Brexit ultras worked hard to undermine attempts to retain a decent, rational relationship with Europe. They seemed to believe our biggest trading partner and nearest neighbours would simply disappear. Sovereignty was paramount, the world view of a two-year-old supreme. Four and a half years later, and here we are. I won't go into exquisite detail here. Quite simply, the UK wasted three years as a succession of unworkable ideas were booted out by either the EU or Parliament. Ironically, Brexiters contributed to the stalemate as they continued to vote down proposals for not being hard Brexit enough. Eventually, July 2019, ushered Boris Johnson into 10 Downing Street. Cummings came with him as chief advisor. It is no coincidence that various ugly situations then followed, including the illegal attempted proroguing of Parliament. Eventually, Labour and the Lib Dems were conned into voting for an early general election in December. Labour's position on Brexit was never satisfactory. Too many of Jeremy Corbyn's clique believed that leaving would allow more socialism in, rather than understanding that the EU was, thanks to its proportionally elected parliament, still more socialist than the UK ever would be under the Tories. The same may apply to their voters. What EU gripe could possibly be made better by backing the Conservatives? Using glib slogans like get Brexit done, his usual boosterism and that baffling voting in some Labour areas, Johnson won a Tory parliamentary majority. His oven-ready withdrawal agreement sold out Ulster's DUP with its commitment to a UK customs border down the Irish Sea. This keeps an open EU border between the Republic and Ulster under the terms of the Good Friday Agreement, which brought relative peace there. Except still nothing was resolved. Britain left the EU in name at the end of January, leaving 11 months of a transition period to reach some sort of trade and customs agreement. A deal that, as I've indicated, is impossible because nobody knows what Brexit means. Assorted extensions had been used before the UK did technically leave the EU and begin this transition period. Now the COVID-19 pandemic struck the world. Johnson and his cabinet may have made the single biggest error of any UK government ever when the chance to extend the transition period was passed up in June. With the virus damaging economies through mass shutdowns imposed to save lives, I'm quite sure the EU would have agreed. Six months grace, even a year would have made sound sense, if a deal was intended. In spite of baseless attacks over their perceived intransigence at talks, the EU have behaved like the adults in the room. Government ministers have been obliged to admit that good faith in Parliament, even if they brief otherwise to friends in the media. Johnson's September Internal Market Bill did further harm to those negotiations. 
the oven ready agreement wasn't so ready after all. The new bill effectively allows the government to break international law if it wishes, admitted again in Parliament, in the shape of the EU withdrawal agreement provisions for the Irish situation. We further tarnished any international reputation we might have and the EU was thoroughly unimpressed. The new bill also put at risk the peace agreement and its open Irish borders which EU membership had facilitated, seemingly a surprise to Brexiters. Further surprising them was that future agreements with the US would then be nigh impossible. Too many people of Irish descent in US politics even before Trump lost the presidential vote to Joe Biden. Declining to extend the transition in June, despite the pandemic, suggests that no deal was what Brexiter extremists intended all along. The internal market bill reinforces that. Note that in October, Michael Gove, Minister for the Cabinet Office, was reported as seeing the no-deal abyss looming and being terrified of it. This, however, is the same Michael Gove who briefed that lorry queues of 7,000 trucks in Kent should be expected and exhorted businesses to get ready when even his government has, as yet, no idea what readiness might entail. Almost as if they are looking for somewhere to deflect blame again. Johnson and his cabinet of third-rate sycophants have only talked of deals. That a majority of economists, businesses and specialist commentators see no deal as a disastrous recipe for major job losses, food shortages and other serious lasting damage to the ordinary people of the UK is not, and has never been, their concern. The consequences for them, and especially their paymasters, will always be offset by money, especially money that will shortly fall outside EU regulation. November polls show 52% of the population now opposes Brexit. Only 38% still claim to support it. Negotiations continue, though surely for only the thinnest and meanest of deals now. No deal has probably won. For the true Brexit fanatics, a series of coups under the thin wrappings of legitimate democracy has enabled a government of economic extremists to drag the people of the UK with it down into the abyss. Chin chin. <laughs>